half in the bag. My diaper's filled. Wow, now that we're done watching Morbius, do you want to watch Morbius? No. Let's watch something else. Okay, let's see what else is on the TV. Oh, you want to watch this? No. What else have we got on streaming? Oh, do you want to watch this? No. What else have we got on streaming? Oh, do you want to watch this? No. What else have we got on streaming? How about this? No. Give me a... Oh my god. I, it's going to have the same movies when you do it. Would you like to watch this on streaming? No. What about this? No. What about this? What, what are these movies? Are these real? That's a no. What about this? I don't know. What about this? No. What about this? No. What about this? No. What about this? No. What about this? Nope. Uh, your turn. No, that's the movie, is Nope. Oh! I guess we could watch Nope. Do I hit power to watch it? I think I think the power's already on, you gotta hit. If I hit power, that's like, it's, it's, it's gonna power up the movie, right? I, we could try that, I don't know. That's not what we've done for the last 73 movies we've watched, but maybe it'll go quicker this way. What if I hit OK? You that hit, might do it. You hit OK once to rent the movie, and then you hit OK again to confirm that you're renting the movie. I'm hitting it. And okay. then you hit OK again to play the movie. Oh my god, it's asking for a 46-digit passcode. Did you have one written down? I think, I think I remember it. Let me see the remote. I'll try it. I got notes. Let me try I wrote it. Down notes. For all my passcodes. Wait, wait, I think I got it. Oh, that's the wrong one. Let me try oh, again. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I used this unofficial Batman trivia challenge book to, to save all my passwords and passcodes in it. I, every, every 116th letter I circled. Oh. And that is one passcode for a site, but I didn't write down which site it was. Oh, so you don't know if it's Amazon or if it's like a, like a voodoo? Well, see right here, I got, I got, I think this is like Netflix maybe, or Peacock, or, so we have an F, a W, an O, an E, an S, a parenthetical, a well, dash. Wait, let's try this. They say that they can, they can email you a new passcode. So let me confirm that they'll email you a new passcode. Okay, let me go get to my typewriter to check my email. Now, do you know the password for your email to check? It's in the book somewhere. Oh, no. Uh, but first, do you think I need to know what my email is? Why I have, is this so hard? I have a few emails. One's Mike at Lightning Fast VCR Repair and Services Incorporated dot NL. Oh. So I it think says that your Amazon account is linked to an AOL.com email. Do you know your password for that email? Well that email was 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 bought out by Google. Oh. So I had to create a Google Plus account, which I don't think is valid anymore. I could try to reset my Google Plus account, but now that goes through Yahoo. Oh, Jesus Christ. What, should we try to guess the, the 46 digit passcodes? Can we look on Amazon and see if Nope is available on VHS? I don't then think Then we it. can just put it in the VCR. Maybe we could call Jordan Peele and ask him to transcribe the film over the phone for us. Okay, hang on. That's not a phone, that's a, that's a remote. Oh. Watching movies is too hard now. It is. I remember the old days when I would turn on the boob tube and there would be seven channels and I'd turn the dial and the channels would come in. And every so often there would be an illegal broadcast of someone, someone pr pressing toy bean tiles on the ground and talking about the government takeover, and I would watch that, and I would think that it was part of the Jack Benny show, oh, like oh. it was a bit. But then it would fade out, and I and I and I would look outside, and there'd be a car driving by with like a big satellite on the roof. Oh. Uh, so I think it was an illegal broadcast, but so was Jack Benny. 
Is this the farmer's almanac? Because I'd like to find out if it's going to rain next month. Oh, both the movies are over. Oh. Oh, I didn't even watch them. Oh, did you fall asleep again? I did. Oh. But uh, I rewatched them tomorrow. Well, how about I just explain to you what happened in them? No. Oh. How about we have a cold beverage? Oh, that sounds like a good idea before we talk about the films. Historically, a cold beverage has always perked me up. Yeah. And it got me out of my old folk funk. When did beers get so heavy? Oh, oh God. Did you, did you do it? Yeah, but I injured my hand. I'm gonna have to go through six weeks of therapy for that. Oh. Oh, man. I feel the life coming back to me. I feel so much better now. You know the great thing about this framing device? It'll never get old. No. Yeah. Anyway, do you want to talk about these motion pictures? Uh, yes, I would love to. Okay. Our first film. Oh, we do we have intros? Uh, no. New bit. No. Oh. Intros on the fly. Intros on demand. IOD. I'll start with spin me round. Okay. Tuscan Growth has a program where they take all the top managers to Italy. Amber, pack your bags. What? You're going to Italy. Spin Me Around is the new film from director Jeff Bainna, whose previous works include Horse Girl, uh, what's the movie with Arby Plaza, and uh, uh, came out in 2017. Oh, you already failed. No, 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 this is part of the process. Uh, oh. oh. Uh, and, and Albert Plaza and uh, uh, Elsa Brie. Um, the Little Hours? The Little Hours and uh, something else. Life After Beth. And, uh, also with Aubrey Plaza. Okay. Uh, Joshy. Joshy, yes, I've seen Joshy. Uh, so this is the new film from director Jeff Baina, and it stars Alison Brie, uh, Aubrey Plaza, Fred Armisen, Tim Heidecker, Molly Shannon, Zach Woods. Uh, and a slew of other cast uh, of people that are in the film. Uh, the film is a story about uh, Alison Brie who works at a, a, a chain Italian restaurant called Tuscan, Tuscan, Tuscan something. The Tuscan Sun, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a knockoff of Olive Garden. And she gets uh, invited to go to a retreat as a manager. She's a manager. Lil Ray Howard is in it. That's not his name, by the way. You called him that on the last episode. What's his name? It's like Lil Rel something. Because I saw there was some comment on the last episode. I thought like, it was Lil, Lil Ray. Ray. Lil Ray Howard. It's Lil, Lil Rel Howry. Oh, boy. Which is why, yeah, you glance at it. It looks like it says Lil Ray Howard. Okay, I'm sorry, Lil Ray Howery. Lil Rel. L I'm sorry, Lil Rel Howery uh, is in the film. Look, guys, Nick's in the study working. What is this, Clue? He's killing Colonel Mustard with the uh, lead pipe? Uh, and uh, uh, Alison Brie wins the prize as one of the managers to go to this retreat in Tuscany, Italy, for all the managers, nationwide managers of this, this terrible chain of Italian restaurants to go to some like culinary experience in Italy. And uh, uh, the things go wild. And that's all I'll say right now because we don't want to show too much trailer footage because YouTube will flag our video. Anytime there's a song in the trailer that you get flagged for the song, YouTube's just a, a mess. Yes, It's yes. a nightmare, as yes. they say. Yes. So that's, that's that. Um, uh, I guess we're out of we're out of the we're out of the description phase. Right now, we're gonna start talking about the film. <laughs> okay, and can only get better from here. Yeah, and just in case we slip into spoilers, spoilers until we talk about Nope. Zip to this timeline. If you haven't seen Spin Me Round, first of all, I'd recommend it. I'd recommend it. Okay, then 
Uh, if you've seen Spin Me Around, watch this review. If you haven't, maybe skip ahead and watch uh, watch Spin Me Around first, and then come back and watch the review. But but skip the nope if you don't give a crap about Spin Me Around. Oh no! You need to excuse yourself. I, yeah, I'm sorry. Is that okay? I mean, I don't want you to miss out. This is supposed to be hysterical. Uh, I I first heard about this film. I watched a little bit of uh, the Office Hours podcast with, uh, with Tim Heidecker and friends. Mm. I keep getting that confused with the Office Ladies podcast, which is Angela and Jenna Fisher just talking about every episode of The Office. Fred Armisen is, is frequently on as a guest, an in-studio guest. Uh, I had never heard of this film, and they were talking about going to the premiere. Big premiere last night in Hollywood at the London right. Hotel. It was yeah. kind of confusing. Yeah. We were like, huh? They asked me what my character's name was, blanked. Do you know now? Yeah. What is it? So many people in it that I like. Well, I have discovered that I guess I'm a fan of this director. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, Horse Girl, um, and I was like, oh, he always works with the same people. Uh, Molly Shannon shows up in a lot of them. Molly Shannon. Uh, Alison Brie, and then Aubrey Plaza, which I just found out he's married to, so that explains that. Um, and they seem to just kind of like, hey, I got an idea. Let's just go make this thing and we'll fuck around in Italy for a few weeks. Right. And, and that, that was it's, my... It's sort of like the, like the indie version of the Adam Sandler model, except all these people are way more interesting and talented. Yes. <laughs> they are not complete check cashing hacks. Yeah. They're like, we'll go to Italy and make this movie, but we should try and do something interesting with it. And I guess the... I, I watched a couple of interviews with the director. He did... Um, he did the YouTube rounds, the pu the press junket rounds. The YouTube press junket. We made fun of that with uh, uh, Neil Blomkamp when that demonic movie came yes. out. Yes. The uh, one guy interviewing him from his car. Hi, Neil. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? Good. Oh, man. Um, it is an honor to talk to you, sir. Oh, thank you. And so uh, this, this Jeff Baina guy, the director, was like, the lady started off talking about Alfredo sauce. She's like, Alfredo sauce is, the way you portray it in the film is disgusting. I will mm -hmm. never look at Alfredo sauce the same again. That's great. Yeah. I'm, glad I, I'm glad I had that much of an impact on your life. And then he's like, he's like, I'm glad you got something out of the film. <laughs> and, and I'm like. Mission accomplished. Um, watching, watching Spin Me Round, I was like, this director he's just dripping with cynicism. He hates people. Oh, fun fact about me is I used to be a twin, uh, almost, because my sister died in utero. Cool. 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 Fun fact, but okay. And I, I think I love that <laughs> because I hate people too. This film is so like... Well, it makes sense that he's with Aubrey Plaza then because she's so sarcastic and dry. There's a lot of sarcasm to this. There's a lot of like, there's, you know, obviously there's the ha hatred of the, the corporate mentality, um, the, the way people act in, in social settings, how, how dumb people are. <laughs> I mean, it's just seething with contempt for the human race. <laughs> And I think that's why I loved it, was that there was no kitschy, uh, heartwarming, indie kind of stuff to it. But it was very tongue-in-cheek in, well, in terms of Yeah, I mean, right from the poster, which looks like a, an old ro cheesy romance novel. And I got excited just from the opening credits. I noticed the score for the movie, and the show's like playing it completely straight. The score is done by uh, Pino DiNaggio, who did all of uh, Brian De Palma's movies. So it has that kind of like... Is he a wine? <laughs> I'm just curious. He is now. Oh, did he die? No. Oh. It'd be funnier if he died, I guess. He but... died and the, they put his ashes in a vineyard. Yeah. And he grew beautiful Pinot, Pinot grapes. Yeah, no. The glass of Pinot de Nagio. I want to turn into a million barrels of Pinot. Yeah, but no, he did the score for the movie. He did all the Brian De Palma movies. And it has that kind of like super serious, melodramatic kind of over the top, but played straight. Juxtaposition. Yeah, a juxtaposition of how goofy and stupid everybody is. <laughs> I just want one good one. <laughs> so that coupled with the first few shots with these beauty shots of uh, the, these uh, meals being prepared, and it's just the, 
I have a friend that used to work in restaurants like those types of restaurants and he'd say, I'm not a cook, I just heat up food. And so you see just, yeah, the, these gross looking plates of uh, pasta. Yeah. When the, that, uh, the Alfredo sauce in bags and the when that when that started, I was laughing hysterically nonstop. Mm -hmm. It was very uh, akin to the opening of Willy Wonka, where there's the factory making all the candy, but they have that beautiful score playing over that. that and, and the font too is like this pinkish kind of uh, yes. romantic, uh, lush uh, yes. font choice. Juxtaposition once again the 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 cold harsh realities of a corporate uh, Italian restaurant chain. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, pa the pasta being put into boxes and the afraid sauce coming out of machines. <laughs> it's, the, it's so cynical. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. I don't tell many stories. And this is the most uninteresting story you'll ever hear. Okay. I think about three or four times in my entire life, I went to a place called Panera Bread Company. And I'm waiting to get my food put up on the counter where they put all the food and you could see all the little characters in the background pressing down the panini press and it all kind of looks like a restaurant. <laughs> it looks then, like is the keyword. And then I think an employee broke protocol because they have a soup heater machine out front that I, uh, I'm not sure if you're supposed to take out the metal soup container and bring it in the back mm. and then come back out. But this kid, he was, he was, um, uh, over, overweight, uh, with a disgusting, disgusting beard and maybe a nose ring, mm. uh, and a dirty apron. And he comes out of the back with maybe about a 10 pound bag, plastic bag of broccoli cheddar soup with the sealed plastic cap <laughs> on it. And he undid the plastic cap and he turned it over and he just started dumping it into the thing until it was all gone. Yeah, something tells me you're supposed to do that in the back. I'm not naive. I realize there's not a chef in the back with fresh broccoli and ingredients <laughs> making the soup. Yeah. And then the, the, the Panera Bread Company truck parked out back, gave it all away once I was leaving. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm not... I'm not stupid. Uh, seeing that in the movie, in that tone, <laughs> just just set it set the stage. It set the tone for the whole movie, uh, and it applies to all the characters too. The fraudulence, yeah. The front, it's a front, mm -hmm. and I just I I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Alison Brie is uh, uh, picked for this uh, not contest, but. They pick uh, managers from restaurants and fly them to Italy to teach them about the culinary arts. Which, which I discovered in one of his, uh, Jeff Bain of the director's uh, YouTube interviews, is that it's somewhat based on a real story. Oh, okay. Uh, not all the romance and all that kind of crazy stuff, but the idea that uh, a manager of a quote-unquote unnamed Italian chain restaurant... He didn't want to get sued exists in the US, but he said a manager had a similar experience where they fly 10 or so managers out to Tuscany, Italy, and they have a thing and th th they taught them how to cook bolognese and they had them, instead of staying in a, a luxury Italian villa, they put them up in kind of like cheap dorms. <laughs> and she's like, it was, this was a fucking waste of time. It was a miserable experience. I flew home. Um, but of course, this plot has more nefarious purposes because um, and it was really kind of like obvious when uh, Tim Heidecker and Zach Woods uh, aka Gabe from the office aka Gabe from the office Tim's character is named Fran and Zach Woods character is named Dana mm -hmm. and so they obviously they both have non-gender specific names which could be interpreted as female so yeah. Uh, and then, and everyone else that's there is female. As females, perhaps even within a certain age range, with the exception of Molly Shannon. So yeah. I, I think it's like every year he's just like, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing my research. <laughs> Find ten, 10 female managers and bring them out here. The odds are one of them will be attractive. Mm -hmm. And then they find the history photos <laughs> locked in the vault of all the past years, and and the sleazy owner is posed next to the most attractive female in the group. 
<laughs> and it seems to be a scam for him to uh, put the moves yes. on. Uh, but, but it, you know, it gets more complicated than that. I'm just saying, if something sketchy is going on here, maybe Kat has something to do with it. This program sucks! Well, it's a, it's a weird movie because, yeah, it's like this... It kind of feels like a... Not parody of a thriller, but like a comedy with these thriller elements that are played mostly straight, even though everything's so ridiculous. Um, there's obviously the romantic angle with Alison Brie's character. She's like, oh, maybe if I go to Italy, maybe I'll meet somebody. It'll be romantic. And she's, she's naive. She's naive to, uh, to uh, not only the corporate world, but the world. To men, <laughs> to in men. general. Yeah. So I got all these photos from the other manager trips. Do you notice anything? Um, there's regular ones and there's crazy ones, like they're, like they're making them silly faces and stuff? Yeah, but look closer. Her backstory is she just got out of a pretty intense relationship mm -hmm. where I think the guy was demeaning to her or there was some kind of angle to it. There's something weird, yeah, she just doesn't stand up for herself. She's very, like, demure and right. kind of mousy. Yeah. I technically took a year off to open a restaurant um, with tablets at every table, but... My ex put all the debt on my credit cards and killed my credit and it went under, so I'm back. And now I'm here. All right. Uh, and, and shockingly really bad reviews? I guess that's not too surprising because if you're looking at this as just a comedy, it's a very specific tone and it's very like dry. Yeah. Except for when it's not, which is what I say when the improv -y stuff happens, sometimes it gets a little sillier. And uh, let's see, my, my great uncle invented squirts. Sports? Sports. Okay. But the general story is played so kind of dry and serious, like I mentioned the music. And, that, and that's, that's a lot of the comments that I saw review-wise. Like the, the tone for me is like right up my alley. And, and that's one of the funnier parts to me is the complete total sham <laughs> of, a, of, of a cooking class. Yeah. You got that, the, the, the chef de cuisine who's, who's in charge of all the, she's like, okay, here's what we're doing today. <laughs> we're making this. And, you know, Tim Heidecker's character, he's like, he's like the, the wannabe gastro uh, chef yeah. talking about liquid nitrogen. And he, he wants to be more. When he like, was on like a reality show, right? Yes, yeah. and, and where he competed against children <laughs> and he lost. Uh, he's he's a fraud, yeah. And he's he's doing his best, and he, he wants to like learn things. And she's like, no, we're boiling the noodles, <laughs> we're putting in, and she doesn't care. And and then it evolves into we're watching videos, like they watch just, Life is Beautiful. Yeah. This has nothing to do with anything. They're just kill. It, it takes place in Italy. Uh, yeah, they're killing time, <laughs> so that the the owner of this company um, can can run his scam. Mm -hmm. Uh, but like you mentioned, the the kind of serious topic of obviously taking advantage of women, it's never it never becomes like a message movie. No. So I can see that not working for some people, yes. or it's like maybe you should take this more seriously. And that's that's the the normal sequence of events. But it's that it just gets completely insane at the end. <laughs> it falls apart in the best way for me. It's it's more uh, raunchy, but it has a bit of a sitcommy vibe to it. With the, oh, it's a, things are just a misunderstanding. I, I was going to mention. Sort of corny, but it, it works, yeah. uh, given the, the tone of the rest of the movie. If there was a great, great sitcom about managers of the Tuscan Grove, like The Office, where there's different branches of Dunder Mifflin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if the Tuscan Grove show, this would be a really great two-parter episode. This is a special episode, shot on location. Yeah. Where where this, this wacky thing happens with the CEO, the David Wallace character <laughs> in the Tuscan Grove Empire. Uh, very kind of lighthearted, deals with some serious issues, but also has a compelling mystery and lots of twists. And also just gets really weird. It gets really weird. <laughs> La last episode, we talked about uh, the Chekhov's gun theory. Mm -hmm. This movie, it's the Chekhov's wild boar theory. 
<laughs> oh, that's yeah. We didn't even mention that wild boars play into the story. You could uh, you could get lost. There are boars. Boars? Oh, I don't really smoke. Don't inhale then. Okay. I have become a much bigger fan of Alison Brie. I, I've I've liked her since Community. I, I've never watched a single episode of Community. Um, I've seen her in all seven seasons of Mad Men. I recently watched all of Glow. Oh yeah, which she's is good on that. amazing she's, show. She's very good at playing pathetic. Yes, <laughs> she she's good at playing the the naive character that gets caught up in a more complex story. So much brick. Forget. If you just hand me your passports, I'll hold on to them before it's time to head home. Yes, sir. That's yay. Now, you're mine. <laughs> <laughs> He's so fun. We're getting kidnapped. We're getting... Have you read Garcia Marquez? Mm-mm. I don't think so. Well, yeah, later in the movie, when she starts to kind of become suspicious of this whole thing with the boss, you know, it's very convenient, fortuitous, that she immediately, you know, meets the, the, the CEO of this company and they're already having this beautiful romantic day. She gets swept up, it, up in it at the moment, but then as, as it goes along, he takes her to a party and you see, like, you can see that's where she's starting to kind of think like, hey, maybe this is too good to be true, but I'm still going to be polite. I'm still going to have hope that this is a real thing. Like, yeah, she's good with that stuff with, uh, without saying anything. Right. Right. Alison Brie gets picked up in a van by uh, Ben Sinclair. It's the bearded guy. In the front seat is the dumb girl. Mm -hmm. And she starts talking about something. Alison Brie's emotions internally, without saying a word, are, oh, this girl seems nice. Oh, she's really, really dumb. <laughs> Just try to act polite <laughs> as best as you can. Yeah, okay. Uh, she plays it much more with much more complexity of, of that, that delicate balance of, of suspicion and politeness that, that is almost threaded throughout this entire movie mm -hmm. of like, oh, you have a folding table <laughs> with a hot pot and one pan, <laughs> and this is the like the mega kitchen of, <laughs> of a major corporation. And she's watching it, you know. <laughs> a lot of actors get credit for big, bombastic, loud performances. Your Leonardo DiCaprio's, where you're screaming and yelling and yeah. and crying and emo emoting. But I think the real talent of acting is subtlety and uh, expressing that exact feeling you get mm -hmm. if you are in that situation. Like you are thrust into this like pathetic class that's highly suspicious <laughs> and- uh, Immediately. It, yeah. That's it, the thing, it's not like a slow revelation that this is all a front. It's like immediately you're like, this is ridiculous. We're gonna have a lot of fun here, eat a lot of great food, learn about Italian culture, and most importantly, grow as people. Did you know that the very first assembly of photographs to create a motion picture was a two second clip of a black man on a horse? And that man is my great, great grandfather. Great. There's another great. Uh, nope, it's the latest film from Jordan Peele. This one's about aliens. Is it, is it as good as Get Out? Nope. Is it as creepy as Us? Nope. Is it another step in Jordan Peele's uh, transformation into M. Night Shyamalan? Yeah, nah, nah, nah. Yeah! Uh, kinda, not really. It's nope. There's my intro. Uh, yeah, nope. I saw, a t I think I saw a TV ad for it. And I was like, Jordan Peele, from the mind of Jordan Peele. And a couple of little images. Never watched the full trailer. I don't think I did either. And then never uh, got off my ass to go watch it in the theater. I think it did like really well opening weekend and then second weekend was like a huge drop. 
because um, the other Jordan Peele movies have done pretty well, which is worth pointing out. He's one of the, the uh, filmmakers that can get a movie made based on his name now, which is more and more rare, where the promotional materials are all built on the filmmaker. Like, that doesn't happen anymore. It's like Tarantino and who else that's still where that's like the marketing is like, it's this guy you know who made the movie. Yeah, Colin Trevorrow. Colin Trevorrow, of course. But uh, yeah, where it's like the filmmaker is the IP because it's not a Marvel movie or... But, uh, as my intro alluded to, I don't think this is as good as other movies, but I think it's weird and interesting on its own. Um, I kind of like that, because Get Out is like, I don't know, objectively, it's a pretty solid movie. Uh, just as far as like a straightforward movie goes. Us is a little more abstract and weird, and if you look at it literally, it kind of falls apart. You have to look at it as like a nightmare. Uh, but it's really creepy and interesting. Would you call it the Jackie Brown of the Quentin Tarantino... Filmography? Filmography. Wait, which one? Us? No, no, no. Uh, nope. Nope. Um, Where you have Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction... Uh, oh, yeah, and then it's like, And then oh. you get to Jackie Brown, and you have thousands of college students coming in, and then... They're expecting one thing, and... And they're like, Who's Pam Greer? Yeah. And then they, they, uh, that was boring. And then they all like are scratching their heads walking out. Yeah. I think that's an apt analogy. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, Cause this doesn't have, his other movies have obviously the kind of social commentary We don't angle. feel that way about Jackie Brown, by the way. No, Jackie no. Brown's my favorite Tarantino movie. So we'll, we'll just throw that in. Uh, just... But the expectations that were put on it based on, especially after Pulp Fiction, which was like the biggest movie ever, um, and then Jackie Brown is so slow in comparison and not flashy in the way Pulp Fiction was. It doesn't have the, uh, the snappy dialogue. The soundtrack it's, and all it's, that. Uh, I mean, it has a great soundtrack, but it's not instantly memorable the way Pulp Fiction was. Instantly iconic. No Jack Rabbit Slims. Yeah, yeah. Instead, you've got uh, Robert Forster talking about the fact that he's getting older and he's got hair plugs. And that's the movie. <laughs> Pam Greer complaining that she has a big ass now because she's in her 40s. <laughs> it's not the cool characters from, uh, from Pulp Fiction. And yeah, this is kind of the same way where it's like the, uh, the iconography of us, all the people in the red jumpsuits, the one glove, like it's instantly like recognizable. And then this is just like uh, uh, Daniel Kaluuya. Just mopey, Kalayua. Kalay however you pronounce his name, it's just him being like mopey. He's like the least like uh, like a likable protagonist right. in a movie in a while, and it's so slow. And not in a bad way, but it's a very slow movie. But uh, yeah, it's it's odd. I it would further compare it to an M Night Shyamalan movie, where it's like it's not super realistic. The uh, the characters are kind of odd and say things that don't feel realistic. Didn't I tell you this motherfucker was gonna come up here with a non-electrical camera? Let's go, boy! Yeah! Everything about it's just weird and off. <laughs> Fuck you. In a way that I can see being off-putting to some people, but I really liked it because of that. What's a bad miracle? Well, I watched the trailer today. I never watched it. After having seen the movie. After having seen the movie, and I... I I noticed like, yeah, kind of like the misleading, intentionally misleading trailer about aliens and blah, blah, blah. But then it turns out, and as a man who has a long history of Star Trek, it's very Trek-ish in mm. terms of premise. Spoilers, because there's nothing to skip to. <laughs> Spoilers for Nope. It feels like it could be a, a UFO situation, but then it turns out to be a weird life form that's uh, hiding in the Yucca Valley in California inside a cloud mm -hmm. that feeds on horses. Yes, and well, yeah, you think it's a spaceship, forms. and it turns out it's an actual physical being. Right. right. And um, then it takes different shapes, and 
Well, the reason it's decided, as we discover throughout the movie, the reason it's kind of settled in this valley is because of the Stephen Jung character who's been feeding it horses. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a sideshow for his yeah, carnival. Yeah, he has a he has like a like a western town, and he was a former child star. This is where it gets very unwieldy, where it's like all these kind of elements that do have a purpose, but it feels like he was, on, he was on a sitcom when he was a kid with a monkey and the monkey freaked out and killed people. And you're like, what does that have to do with anything? But it does tie in, um, in, in sort of a not very spelled out way. But it's like he thinks when he was a kid on that sitcom, he thought he had some sort of connection with the monkey and that's why the monkey didn't kill him. Turns out the monkey didn't kill him because he didn't look it in the eyes and that plays in with the, the alien ship. So he thinks he has some sort of connection with this this alien being yes. because he feeds it horses. Right. It reminded me of Grizzly Man where it's like Grizzly Man, he thinks he has that connection with the bears. It's like, no, he doesn't. Then the bears just eat him. It's all it's all a fantasy. It's all your your own imagination. Right. But it's it's so presented so kind of vaguely where I could see people being like, What's the stuff with the monkey? You know, that was the more interesting stuff of the movie to me. Yeah, yeah. And that like the animalistic behavior of a creature that that you can't quite control. You do, yeah, you don't have a personal connection with this thing. You just right. have to learn to work with it basically. Or, or, or tame it in a smart way. Right, like a horse. Like a horse, yeah. I'm still kind of wrapping my head around what it might really be about. I kind of got the impression it's about like Hollywood and chewing people up and spitting them out because that's kind of literally what the creature does. He likes Twilight Zone, obviously, and he, has, he likes the Twilight Zone-esque twists, mm -hmm. pulling the rug out from under you, where you think it's a UFO, but it ends up being an alien. And, and a different kind of horror. And I think that's what I liked about it was instead of like, like us had that great scene when uh, the, the evil versions break into, was it uh, Elizabeth Moss? Yeah, her and Tim Heidecker. Yeah, and, and they're uh, twins. And there's a lot of brutality and violence and stabbing. And this is like all those spectators at the at the ranch get sucked up into this alien thing and they're all like horrifically being digested in its esophagus and it's presented in a way where visually you're sort of like what am i looking at what like is it's, this yeah. yeah but but the screaming and you can hear it up in the sky and it, it's disturbing mm -hmm. in in a different way than your classic horror movie but i will agree with you the the leads are sort of uh, a little unfocused. Yeah, like I get what they're doing with this character, that he's just sort of stuck in this situation because the, the, the horse, com the company, it's his father's business. It's been in the family for generations that they train these horses for movies. And he's just sort of like stuck there, but he's so kind of miserable to watch. Well, he's because <laughs> he's so grumpy. <laughs> they, they counterbalance that with the enthusiasm of the sister and right. uh, the Best Buy employee guy, Circuit City employee guy. Angel, oh, it, right? It was Fry's. Fry's, yeah, which I didn't even know was still a company. Fry's Electronics. It's mainly out west. Okay. But, um, he, yeah, those two counterbalance his lack of enthusiasm, and Daniel Kaluuya is. Uh, traumatized by the death of his father. So he's like kind of miserable and he doesn't know if he wants to do the horse thing anymore because the patriarch of it is dead. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, there could have been a little kind of spark or change when he discovers this plot of the UFOs, yeah. which there kind of is, but I think a, a little more enthusiasm from his character, a little more like uh, clarity on their plan like, I think they wanted to, to videotape it, to sell it. Well, that's that's another aspect, would I say. It seems like it's kind of about Hollywood. Right. Or it's like they want to capture it almost like they're paparazzi. And then at one point in the movie, TMZ shows up. And that's presented very dramatically, which made it funnier. And it's, it's TMZ. <laughs> the guy on the motorcycle. The guy on the motorcycle, yeah. is trying to get pictures of it. Yeah. So it kind of becomes like about celebrity. And then you have Stephen Young's character, who is a child star. So that's, and obviously they're training horses for movies. So there's that whole Hollywood aspect to yeah, it. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't feel as, as sort of clear as the other movies in terms of that kind of social political angle. Um, I, I kind of like that, like very slow sense of discovery of what's happening and them kind of 
having to fly by the seat of their pants. It reminds me of Tremors a little bit. Right. I uh, got that same vibe. Yeah, where it's like they're always trying to stay one step ahead of the threat. Mm -hmm. and they're kind of making it up as they go along. But then you have also kind of what I say, M. Night Shyamalan feels like a character right out of one of his movies is the cinematographer guy. Um, it was so odd, and like his dialogue is weird, his performance is weird. It was nice to see him. That's, uh, the actor's name is Michael Wincott. He was the main villain in The Crow way back when. And so I was like, oh, he's a good actor, and I haven't seen him in anything in a while. But yeah, he's just such a bizarre character, very unrealistic, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, just very off. Everything feels off. One technical aspect I wanted to bring up, very clearly day for night. Not the worst day for night, but I noticed, I think it's the first time uh, Daniel Kaluuya is outside at night and there's like a hard shadow from his hat going onto his face. I was like, that wouldn't be there at night. This is day for night. It's not the worst I've ever seen, but still don't do it. Would you like to hear what some People who didn't like it thought. I, I would love to. Right from the start, Daniel Kalaluya's character doesn't feel serious. You can tell me if you agree with some of these or not. Doesn't seem serious. Do they mean as far as his performance or the character doesn't take the situation seriously? Like he doesn't really want to do the part. Oh, well that's his character though. The dialogue seems disconnected. Decision making is totally out the window, if there even is any. <laughs> I see the absurdity and the parody of a Western, but nothing makes any sense. I had high hopes, but the movie had one thing right. When I was done watching it, my first comment was, no thanks. That was one thing I did read before, I don't remember where I saw it, but before the movie came out, where people, because I guess the trailer alludes that it's aliens, and so people were trying to figure out if NOPE was like an acronym for something. And so I thought that was kind of funny in the movie, when it's not, it's just, the main they don't going. say in the movie, it's not of planet Earth. But that, is that what it's implied? Because it's just at a certain point, the main character just goes, nope. I, He's like, I'm going to go back I've inside. I've seen not of planet Earth. Okay. But I don't know if that's just some speculation or if it's actually into Well, then I guess the title works both ways. Because, yeah, in the movie, it's just literally what the character says. <laughs> Half star. Nope. Big nope. Instead of a horror sci-fi, I got to endure two hours of cringe. Where is the plot? Where is the background story? Nice character arc from a sulking, cap-wearing, broken-hearted to almost spatial Lone Ranger without as much as by your leave. <laughs> Did they have a stroke while writing that? <laughs> Part of his negative critique is that he was wearing a baseball hat. Boring. Not scary. Exploitation of a real violent incident. Nope, don't go. What's the real violin? In? Did they think the monkey situation really happened? What the fuck did I just watch? Why do people think this is remotely good? Someone please explain how a cloud is supposed to be scary. <laughs> did they stop watching before they realized that it wasn't a cloud? Half a star. Nope, nope, nope. Wanky, self-involved Hollywood self-hand job of a movie. Cheesy Tarantino clone to the end. What? Boring to a T. The title and all nope memes in this movie just show how shallow the movie is. <laughs> our, My favorite bad reviews are the ones where you don't even, you can't even comprehend what they're trying to mean. I would be more challenged reading the back of a toilet door. Do like a stall, stall of a public bathroom? I guess that's a toilet door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and normally when I read the bad reviews, it's laughable because, you know, we watch a really good film and then someone just just doesn't get it. Yeah. And this, I have, a, I have a mild bit of sympathy for the people that were frustrated because they want that... They want stabs and they want jump scares. And well, they you want, want that house that, of mirrors. And you want, they want that monsters. satisfying conclusion, like Get Out has. Like Get Out's a crowd pleaser, and this movie is is slower 
it's a little more abstract and weird. I mean, just the bit with uh, uh, Stephen Young's character when he's the kid and he's hiding under the table and he's looking out and there's that shoe that's just, it's like an anomaly. It's just yeah. standing straight up. Yeah, 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 that was weird. And the, well, that's the thing is like, I could see people being like, what is that? What's the point of that? I think the idea is that it is an anomaly. It makes no sense, but it's so weird that it distracts him so he's not looking the monkey in the eye. And that's why the monkey doesn't kill him. But he's like uh, idolized to this thing now. He's got that shoe in like a glass case. And it's like he's completely oblivious to the fact that that shoe basically saved his life because it prevented him from looking the monkey in the eye. And if he did, the monkey would have killed him. And it's just such a weird like roundabout way of of explaining what's happening in the movie or it doesn't really explain it that's the thing it's all very understated so this doesn't have the the clarity of uh get out and it doesn't have the kind of visual creepiness of us no it, it's it's a uh, it's a slow burn it's a like a discovery and then when you get to the alien creature at the end it doesn't look like a xenomorph it's very abstract and weird. It's it alien. looks like a giant balloon. That's what I liked, is that it's legitimately alien looking. It's not You what, can't comprehend its anatomy at all. It's not what Roland Emmerich would come up with. Exactly. It's like the opposite of a, of a big kind of alien invasion blockbuster movie. But but the idea, the, the theme that uh, Hollywood or the sh or show business uh, because there's a lot of that when they take the horse to the set and they got the old lady who's the old star and, yeah. and the horse like goes a little crazy and then they well, that's how he keeps saying don't look in the eye and that ties in with the alien in, yeah, yeah. And then they replace it with CGI thing that they could sit on mm -hmm. uh, the idea that it sucks you up and spits you out and leaves nothing left yeah uh, I think is a little too specific for general audiences I, I'm sure a lot that's probably why it got great reviews good reviews um, because a lot of the critics probably got it more than your average movie goer who wants to see some kind of bloody scary nightmare movie yeah. when, when it's just like bright daylight and there there's a weird thing flying around the clouds and, <laughs> and it's more um, metaphorical and less like visual and visceral and violent. Yeah. You'll be getting a call from my supervisor asking how my service was. Five stars, Angel, five stars. So Mike, uh, would you recommend? No. I guess we didn't do a recommendation for Spin Me Around. Both these movies, I think we would both recommend. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I. I I enjoyed Nope in the way we just discussed. Uh, and then Spin Me Round, also same thing. I have a very particular taste of uh, uh, sarcastic, dry, uh, nihilistic, misanthropic, uh, <laughs> just, just, uh, ooh. Uh, I hate everyone. <laughs> I hate human beings and what they are capable of. Uh, and I just love laughing in my sick, twisted way. It's not a funny rom-com. You're not gonna laugh. How funny is it that they go out to the Italian restaurant and Alison Brie can't read the Italian menu? Isn't that funny? Do you think that poster would be confusing to people? It seems so intention, so over the top that I think people would get it, but who knows? It reminds me of the uh, uh, Criterion cover for uh, polyester, John Waters' polyester. Does that similar kind of uh, poking fun at melodramatic, romantic uh, uh, cover art? Uh, the word you're looking for is Harlequin. Harlequin romance. romance. Sure, sure. Yes, yes. So they're making fun at the, because that's her vision of what's going to happen in, in Italy when she goes and yeah. she gets a dose of reality <laughs> with, a, with a twist of crazy at the end. <laughs> yeah. So I'll recommend both. Uh, it's slim pickings out there <laughs> in, the, in the streaming world. It's true. We talked a lot about movies today. And then, <laughs> he just wants to go take a nap. Well, it's time for my nap. 